Our mission for this journey? Determine whether Cuba has changed at all since Fidel Castro, 86, handed the reins of power to his 82-year-old brother, Raul. And we're also here to find out if Cuba would just need to wait for the death of both Castro brothers to really turn the page. We landed in Cuba's second biggest city, Santiago, a thousand kilometer east of the capital Havana. It is located in Oriente on the eastern part of the island that juts out into the Caribbean. Here in Santiago de Cuba begins Revolutionary Road. Here at the Moncada. Sixty years earlier, the Moncada was a barracks. It housed the troops of Batista, the strongman of Cuba before the Castro military coup. Today, it's a school. Guided tours for small pioneers, the baby bottle drinking class of the Communist Party. Hello, I am a fifth grade student and I am part of a special museum class. This room was used as a torture chamber and on these panels you can see examples of instruments of torture. Whether it's propaganda or reality, one thing is certain. On July 26, 1953, Fidel and Raul Castro accompanied by 65 men stormed the barracks. Once inside, a thousand soldiers resist them and it was a carnage. Fidel was captured and on the military level the operation was a fiasco. But on the political level, a legend was born. I am very proud that our country is free thanks to all those who have sacrificed their lives. The better we know the history, the better we can defend our homeland. Because when we know, when we know the events, nobody can tell tales about what really happened. We know exactly how it happened. And yet, the machine that keeps the legend alive is running at full speed. Bullet holes carefully redone. Portraits of militants killed during the assault. Arrest and trial of Castro. Guerrillas in the Sierra Maestra. And finally, the final victory against Batista. When we seek out who was the main actor of the revolution, we discover that it was the people. It was the people who were the real heroes. The people protected the fighters after the Moncada attack. And the people joined the rebel forces in the cities and in the mountains against the military dictatorship. These small pioneers ready to carry the torch, that's the Cuban reality like the Buena Vista Social Club, or civil servants who make up 85% of the workforce. But today, Cuba is also a country that is slowly waking up from a long sleep. Some are already anticipating reforms and have began working on a new craft. That's the case for these street musicians, for example. Others are working out of their home to sell everything and anything. In three years, hundreds of thousands of civil servants will become workers in the private sector. Non-state, as it is euphemistically called here. For Joyker, the hairdresser, he's already there. For every peso that I was earning at the state-owned salon, I'd get 10 cents. And so you spend a month working, working, working until 8 p.m. and you end up with a very small salary, really tiny. Joker would earn 13 euros per month, the average salary in Cuba. 
So naturally, in 2011, when the state allowed small businesses to start opening up, Joker opened his own private hair salon. This new measure involves 178 private activities, the Cuenta Propistas, translation my own account. This includes everything from repairing laptops and household appliances to selling DVDs. Basically everything that was done on the black market for years has now become official. Many professionals, even high level ones such as doctors, lawyers, engineers who earn state salaries have abandoned their careers to work on their own. They have become hairdressers or even lighter fillers. Yes, others have opened restaurants, a very profitable venture as Cubans love to eat. At Joyker's, a haircut costs 20 kooks, 15 euros, more than a month's official salary. Expensive, very expensive, but not enough for him to open his own shop. Lack of resources, Joker opens a salon in the house of his grandmother. In return, he pays for the renovation of the house. Here we combine the kitchen and dining room, the only finished part of the house for now. My grandson has worked very hard to make this happen, and thank God he's been doing such a great job. This is in a disastrous state. Look, it fell apart five times, no, six times. One day, as I was going down the stairs, bricks began to fall behind me. I had to run for my life. It now looks like we're going to end up all right. Look, today, for example, we found tiles. Despite the difficulties, we're gradually improving our situation. Modernizing the Cuban model is the code name given to the system of reforms currently in progress. We're getting there. We're moving forward. They are beginning to realize that we need change in this country. The world changes. We too must change. We are part of this world. We can no longer stay behind the times. We are really backward. Young people want a future, they want to live better, enjoy life, acquire things like all young people, dress better, be more fashionable, have a small car. We have many desires and we are gradually moving in the right direction. One hundred thirty thousand public servants have been dismissed in 2011. And by 2015, the non-state sector should only represent 35% of the Cuban economy. Raul Castro has warned of the need to change attitudes. To become aware of this challenge, we went to a state-run hair salon. Here, a cut, collar, and blow-dry costs 40 pesos, that's one euro. 15 times cheaper than Joyker. In this salon, everything belongs to the state. The entire premises, all the machinery, products, and even the hairdressers, since they are all public servants, as is the case for Milagro. I have 40 years of experience in this area. I was awarded the National Medal of the Avant-Garde by the State Council. I taught hairdressing, I love my job, I love this job, I do not count my hours. Milagro is an endangered species because the state coffers are empty. Sign of the crisis, in less than three years almost one and a half million employees found themselves out of work. Here, will it remain state-owned or will you become Quinta Propista? So far, we are state-owned, not Quinta Propistas. But in the future, well, we'll see. We hope that the salon will remain state-owned. Really? Why is that? Because this is the Institute of Beauty of Santiago and we hope that it's how it will remain. 
not sure that Nancy's wishes will be granted. You remember that in Joker's salon, you pay in kooks, while Milagro's state-owned salon takes pesos. So on one hand, you have the peso, which is worth nothing. This is why public sector workers are paid in pesos. The peso only gives access to basic necessities, a little rice, a little coffee, issued on presentation of the famous libretta, the ration book. Then there is the kook. Two categories of Cubans have access to the kook. Those who trade with tourists and those who receive money from abroad. Only these people have access to shops where you can buy shampoo, strollers and other handbags that are not found in the shops where you pay in pesos. Now we head to El Cobre, about 50 kilometers from Santiago. In El Cobre, a few months ago, Pope Benedict XVI came to attend the 400th anniversary of the apparition of the Virgin Mary, patron saint of the island. An exceptional event in a country where the revolution and the church have long maintained very tense relations. When we arrive in Cobre, there's no religious fervor jumping out at you. But what is obvious is the colorful carnival atmosphere. In Cuba, the Virgin is very savvy when it comes to making ends meet. Today the majority of people make a living by doing their own craft. In every house there's a teenager who has already learned to carve with a small knife. This is how it is. But when the party organizes a distribution of alcohol, the street fair turns slightly into a rat race. Very quickly, the police intervene. They check our papers and only return them on the condition that we stop filming. It's too sensitive. These images could damage the reputation of Cuba abroad. It's been only four years the regime has again allowed the procession a renaissance after decades of repression. While the masses are always monitored, the discourse has changed. The church and the nation are one, as evidenced by the Cuban flag at the head of the procession. Today, even the priests sing the national anthem on the steps of the church. The climate has become so serene that Father Armando is ready to announce an even brighter future, this time for the church. This has allowed the church to break with a form of inertia, a certain fear that prevented it from carrying out its mission of evangelizing. So is it the end of an era for the ideology of Marx? where religion was the opium of the people instead of doctrine in Cuba? 
For me, the church is not a drug that lulls you to sleep. Quite a contrary. It is a sister, a mother, a friend who raises us, stimulates our thinking and leads our mind of Christ to humanity and to the human values that enrich us and constitute us as a people. There was a time when believers were struggling to live their faith. Churches were empty. There were very few people, no youth. Today, we can see a real difference. The Cuban churches are open to all. They are full. Many young people are now attending Mass, and that's just wonderful. But what will be the reaction of the regime if the church becomes too powerful? Father Armando will not even entertain this question. As everyone in Cuba, he knows when to be silent. The next morning, we head towards the Sierra Maestra. The Sierra Maestra is a bit like the Vercor for the French resistance during the occupation. Here in the Sierra Maestra is where the legend of the regime was built, an impregnable mountain in the hands of a handful of rebels beginning in 1957. With promises of education and equality, the Barbudos won the hearts and minds of the poor peasants. With their little rifles, they stood up to the forces of Batista. It's here that the troops of Camilo, Che, and Hubert Matos went to take Santiago de Cuba and Havana. Almost 60 years later, what remains of this story? To give us an answer, the party appointed Maria. She works at the Giza Museum. It's Sunday, it's her day off, but she has no choice. She must come with us. We find ourselves on a very emblematic site for the history of this country. The remains of three soldiers were buried here by our commander-in-chief, Fidel which gives this village and all those who visit a touch of love for freedom and for the dreams that we all have. Lunch with Maria. The atmosphere warms up. Maria begins to relax and does a little more than the bare minimum. First, small reward for good behavior. This is Armilio Morgena, who participated in the Battle of Giza, one of the most important fighters after what Fidel wrote himself in several of his books. Here was a very poor village. Nobody had anything. No child went to school because there was no school. The revolution has shaped these people, educated them, and has taught us a lot. Do you see this picture here? This is me when I was 26 years old. For his service, the revolution offered a house to Armelia. With a courtyard to raise a few chickens and fatten up a pig. A little luxury for this man who has not forgotten neither his poor childhood nor working in the fields for one peso a day. Here, have a look at this book. 
A man proud of his history and who savors it in this book where Fidel Castro himself celebrates his bravery. Armilio, an illiterate from the Sierra, retires as a colonel with a pension of 400 pesos, more than the salary of Maria, the price for a hero from the Sierra Marastra. And yet, even here, when we were seen talking with Armilio, a neighbor called the police. We found ourselves in yet another police station to check our papers. This time Maria left her identity card. My manager will arrange it, she assured us. And she invited us to come have coffee at her place. Vengo de una familia campesina. I come from a family of farmers. My father and mother were agricultural workers. They worked in the fields. A family of seven children ate with me. It was very hard financially, because almost all of us were born before the triumph of the revolution. Maria is the only one who went to school. She even earned a doctorate in history. But she had to wait until the age of 38 to leave home and to buy her own house, with the help of the state, of course. All of this has taken me two years, because everything is very slow. Either because they do not give you the materials, or because you do not have any money to pay the builders. Once the camera is turned off, Maria feels free to talk about the lack of money, the remnants recovered to make carpets sell three times for nothing, sadness about nothing to buy her son, and her hope to one day have running water at home. In the Sierra Marestra, sometimes it's hard to defend the system, even for those who have everything. Camagüey. They recently had to close three schools here to accommodate patients diagnosed with dengue fever. There's even cholera. At the city limits, the military are taking drastic measures. Camagüey is a crucial zone. It was here in 2007 that Raul Castro declared war on marabou weeds that were invading abandoned land. As a result, the island imports 80% of its food. Then in 2009, the state gave farmland in Uzifruk to over 100,000 state workers. This is the case of Ruben, 52. I've worked in management my whole life, since I started working. I finished my studies at age 22, and then I was sent to Angola for two years. Upon my return, I was hired as a supervisor at a canned food factory. This old clunker is the besetting sin of Ruben. It cost him 600 euros, four years of civil servant salary. Had he remained in the public sector, he never would have been able to afford it. Ruben raises pigs and grows guava. He's been doing it for 18 months. We are in an agricultural country. We must return to the earth to exploit the resources that we have. This is Rubiel, his eldest son, who is at the origin of the change. It was he who, at age 26, right after getting his accounting license, obtained land and convinced his father to follow his lead. The work here is very hard. The sun, the heat, it's very difficult. But from a financial perspective, if I compare my situation with my friends from college, 
Well, I earn in a month what they earn in a year. The reforms allow Ruben to use daily workers and even fix their salaries. On socialist grounds, this is a turning point. In Cuba, it's a great revolution. I think it's all going in the right direction now, even if there are still plenty of things to do. We need to reconsider certain things, even things we've been doing most recently, check what works and what doesn't. As with any change, there are changes that do not go far enough, at least in my point of view. What changes? Ruben will not say. But not everyone is doing as well as Ruben. Alexei, his neighbor, is 34 years old. Before that, he worked as a clerk in a state-run store. This place was nothing more than a great wasteland with thorny bushes. There were no fences, nothing. The house suffered damage because of Hurricane Ellie in 2008. Our installation here has been quite difficult. Without any training or financial assistance, this son of a farmer who has always lived in the city struggles each day just to get by. Here, we still need to improve our living conditions and increase production to achieve a satisfactory situation. Or better to say, a situation that meets the expectations we had when we decided to leave the city. We lack everything. It's not much of a secret. Even if the state does what it can, and so it's up to us to face this head-on. Alexei and his wife have just returned home. Both had caught dengue fever even while the government claimed the epidemic was under control. The following morning in Camagüey, this time I'm the one that's not feeling good. Digestive disorders, fever, fainting, lurking with dengue fever, and cholera cannot be far off. No choice, must go to the hospital. In the beginning, I didn't worry too much. From the Michael Moore film to the commonplaces spread all over Cuba, the Cuban health model has received such praise that there's no reason to panic. Except when the cameraman is prohibited from filming my admissions. Once I discovered the state of the toilets and around me people dying in the emergency room, then I understood why the censors were there. Because images like these turn up on the internet. They look like what I saw in Camagüey before they lead me into a room reserved for foreigners. Deplorable conditions, walls covered in mold, and emergency equipment installed in a filthy room. Doctors, competent but poor, apologize for the destitution. No drugs for nausea and vomiting, and salt water in place of a drip. We all agree the shoot should continue. And so the next day, our team took to the road without me. I'll just have to join them once I bounce back. Just like Ariel, our fixer, I'm embarrassed to leave the director in this place by herself. But at no time did we think anything could go wrong, and so the filming continues. Camagüey is the heart of sugarcane country with huge farms that belong to the Cuban mythology. In the 60s, they were supposed to prove to the world that the socialist society was more effective than capitalism.
Since the Soviet Union is no longer there to buy sugar, what have become of these farms? And the peasants, the workers, where are they? Ariel had arranged for filming permits in Sugarcane Central. We just forgot to tell her that the factory has been closed since 2007. And so these are the only images we got, and there were that of a ghost town. Yet we just found out that the state has invested $16 million to revive the plant. If this is true, where did all the money go? Cannot understand why the authorities have directed us to this site. Are other plants even less presentable? It remains a mystery. On Revolutionary Road, Santa Clara is a shining star. This is the city of Che. He was said to have conquered here with 300 men against more than 3,000 on the side of Batista. He's been buried here since 1997. Daily, around his mausoleum, small merchants make their living off the reputation of the hero adored by crowds of admirers from around the world. Here, a young Venezuelan. Che represents a breakthrough for us on the path to greatness. We follow a path behind our commander Chavez. We, all of the youth, want equality for all people and we fight against imperialism. Here is David, a sailor from Australia. More Gevara than Gevara himself. It has been my lifelong dream to come to Cuba. It's very good. Uh, no advertising, uh, Coca-Cola, McDonald's, uh, it's it, friendly people, music, culture, art, beautiful, beautiful place. Jay was a, was a, a brilliant humanitarian socialist. Uh, Fidel has heart, heart. Capitalist, uh, it's eating the world. The capitalist war machine is, is eating the world. And I don't want my earth to be destroyed by capitalism. Thank you. It's very common to find people gathering here with these kind of remarks. It's like that in all the holy cities, so why not in Santa Clara? But when the tourist coaches are gone, what happens then? To find out, we delve through the internet and this is what we find. The scene takes place not far from Santa Clara in February 2012. These seven women belong to the Rosa Parks movement for civil liberties. They demand the release of one of their own, arbitrarily imprisoned. They seem pretty harmless. Yet, plainclothes agents monitor the scene closely. And as they don't want the arrest to be filmed, this burlesque scene unfolds. Two agents, who are desperately trying to hide the intervention, try to cover the lens. The story does not say what became of these young women. But this scene happens in Santa Clara, where the legend of Che was born, where it just feeds into the cult of youth around the world. It's so absurd that an idea like that would come to us. Ask the same generation, but this time Cuban. Somehow, who grew up in the world created by Che? 
the merengue, the mix, meeting the youth of Santa Clara. First surprise with this pair of lesbians who appear to have no complex whatsoever. I feel freer than before. Here is a place that respects differences. We can come up with our friends and be happy. People's regard has changed. Now we can go out. Before, a few years ago, if you were seen with your girlfriend, at least as far as girls were concerned, the family would criticize you. You would be judged. Today, it has changed a bit. These kids are actually grandchildren of Che, but are they really the heirs? Here we like clothes, how to be fashionable. If you wear the brand, you're in the game, otherwise you're a has-been. We also love mobile phones, USB flash drives. You see, here to be 20 is to want to burn a little. Have the things that have just come out, just as in other countries. In your opinion, what do you miss the most? We don't want to talk about it. It's better not to talk about it. No, we do not want to talk about it. We're here to have fun. We don't want to criticize the system. But I'm not talking about politics here. What I'm asking is, what would you like and cannot have? I don't know, like going to the beach, having your own house, your own car. What we miss the most? Internet. <laughs> this is what we miss the most. The internet. And be able to play FIFA 2012, like everyone else. Our fixer is Cuban, and so careful with his words. However, this time he insists. And as these young people are fully aware of the red lines, coded dialogue begins. Implicitly, through refusal or laughter, it reveals the opinions of each of them. The elections are approaching. Will you vote? <laughs> Obviously. That's all we are. In any case, it makes you laugh. Can we know what makes you laugh so much? Because of the question. The question here is not whether we want to vote or not. We are obliged. Even if you do not vote for anyone, you do not ask the question if you want to vote or not. You gotta go. It's a mandatory vote. Perhaps what is most lacking in today's youth is the freedom of expression. To be able to express ourselves, and not just on the subject of sexuality, but also on the subject of politics, religion, culture, on all subjects of human life. To be able to express ourselves freely without being oppressed. It would take someone having an interest in this country, and in us, the youth, and in everything that happens in general. Someone who can tell what is happening here, someone who does not judge, who tells the truth about Cuba. So what's the truth about Cuba? What the hell are you asking me this question for? Are you fucking crazy? Do not ask me this question, we already said no politics. This is the truth that scares Cuba. We will stop there. Beyond that, our interlocutors would be taking too many risks. In Cuba today, it's hard to be give out. That night, I decided I would leave. After three days of salt water infusions, my veins have been torn to shreds. And as I've not been drinking or eating anything for the past three days, the production is concerned and has sent me an ambulance from Havana. The trip looks hectic. First of all, the ambulance is an old Brazilian clunker from the 1950s without any air conditioning or shock absorbers. 
And so it's a six hour drive, punctuated with frequent stops, to load up a maximum number of hitchhikers who put their big bags all the way up to my stretcher. Finally, the ambulance dropped me off safe and sound in the middle of the night at the Sierra Garcia Hospital in Havana, reserved for foreigners and party leaders according to all the gossip swirling around. This is the best hospital on the island. That at least is what its website announces. Sierra Garcia Central Clinic provides specialized services with all the amenities and comfort that characterize modern institutions of its kind. Everything has been arranged in advance, a room waiting for me, but once in the room, surprise. They require a deposit of a thousand kooks, almost 800 euros, and that's in cash. The problem? I only have 300 kooks on me, and that's what I offer them. But like in the stories told about the American healthcare system, they tell me, no, no money, no medical care. In the middle of the night, Sierra Garcia's doctor sends me to the clinic Dell 26, the hospital for penniless foreigners, as he says. Rejected by the rich, I join the poor. When I arrive at clinic Dell 26, it's 3 a.m. It's a nightmare. The nurse uses a razor blade for blood sugar control. Because clogged toilets are overflowing, they give me a bucket to use in the corner of a room. I'm laying on a poor plastic sheet in a common space without air conditioning. It's 40 degrees Celsius and I'm being surrounded by patients who have been rejected from the hospital supposed to welcome dengue patients. I can see mosquitoes flying out of their bags. In my film, I wanted to insert a sequence on the equality of the Cuban healthcare system. This couldn't have come at a better time. It allowed me to verify the truthfulness of these testimonies from angry patients circulating on the internet. In Cuba, after 40 years of revolution, here's the truth about healthcare. When you go to the hospital, you must bring your own sheets, soap, chamber pot, and most of the time there's no running water. I had a bleeding following surgery. Well, I had to wipe it off with my... Because in Cuba, there are two healthcare systems. One for the poor, where everything is lacking, and one for the tourists and foreigners who pay in dollars and where nothing is missing. What do you think, my friend? Is that an example of social justice? It's 4 a.m. I'm running away to take shelter in my hotel. It's out of the question to get some energy back just to finish the shooting. I haven't been drinking or eating for four days, and still no medicine. It's becoming dangerous for me. I'm going back to Paris. The cameraman will finish the shooting without me. After driving Lea to the airport, we're back in Havana. With almost 4 million inhabitants, the city has become the largest agglomeration in the Caribbean. The city center was designated a UNESCO World Heritage Site. But behind the cheerful facades, it's a disaster. The housing crisis is catastrophic. Running water is a luxury. Blackouts occur daily. And the streets are seriously run down. Everything depends on the state. Even the wedding cake is funded by the public treasury, as the saying goes. In case of pipe breaks or ceiling collapses, who do you turn to? In Cuba, the socialist magic word holds within three letters. CDR, Committees for the Defense of the Revolution. In Havana, there's a chapter on every street corner. 
Created in the first days of the revolution, CDRs were officially supposed to prevent acts of sabotage. Today, they are public service militias, which keep the population under surveillance. Nancy is president of CDR number no. 8 in District 36. Each year for 16 years, her neighbors recommend her and the party nominates her. There's no surprise since she's the only candidate. Therefore, Nancy rules over three residence buildings. Most common problems are related to housing conditions, standards of living or jobs. For example, if ever they need a recommendation letter, the CDR can make a report on the person's behavior in his own neighborhood and communicate this letter if necessary. Every day, Nancy submits these reports to the Ministry of the Interior. It can be favorable or support an increase in salary, for example. Or it can be unfavorable and denounce counter-revolutionary remarks, bad company or dubious morality. But sometimes, like on this video posted on the internet, the expertise of CDR presidents goes further. They can turn into a police force. This scene took place in December 2011. Banned by the government, Gorky, the leader of the band called Porno Para Ricardo, decides to organize a concert on his balcony. But he's barely begun his first song when the CDR president switches off the building's power supply. Are these the first episodes of a growing protest? Are these dying fires of a collapsing system? To get to the bottom of this, a change of scenery is required. Here is a glorious showcase of the regime. The famous cigar factory, a world class business, a must for all tourists. First, there's the front yard. These pictures keep the legend alive and the business as well. These products are spread before the eyes of enchanted tourists, and rightly so. And then there's the backyard, Karuna's tobacco factory. You can visit it as well, but it displays something else. It's 10 a.m. and like every morning, Dali does a collective reading of the regime's official daily newspaper. We'll start with the Grandma Daily to instruct ourselves with the national and international news. 
Dally has been reading this prose for 17 years. She spent those 17 years conveying to workers the best way to think. I'll start with today's most important international event. The New York police suppresses protesters from Occupy Wall Street. Protesters had planned to form a human wall around the New York Stock Exchange market to protest against the unfair economic system which benefits the rich and corporations to the detriment of citizens with low incomes. The daily program never changes. 8 a.m. Advice for family life. Articles on education, psychology, sexuality. 10 a.m. The Grandma Daily. 1 p.m. Literature. The readings of Monte Cristo or Romeo and Juliet have been so repeated that they ended up giving the same titles to cigars smoked by CAC 40 CEOs. 600. We are 600 workers. There are speakers all over the building and we listen to the reading in the entire company. It's forbidden, of course, to ask workers what they think about the professor and even less about the method. Impressed by all this display, we wanted to learn more about Grandma. And this is how we ran into Jean Guillard. This Canadian from Quebec has decided to retire in Cuba 12 years ago. Since then, he's been writing fiery editorials for the official newspaper. Jean Guillard is a virtuoso of lip service, a rare species of tropical communism. So talking with him feels a little like visiting the Museum of the Cold War. We cannot make any lame comparison with the press in rich countries, where money is flowing in abundance, where indiscretions are allowed. The kind of luxury press which knows no limits at all. In a political context like Cuba today, it is unthinkable to allow for a so-called Western free press, which could publish information that would be immediately used by the United States to cause serious harm to Cuba. Cantarle a Doña